with friends like these, I don't know. <clears throat> so, uh, James is right. Uh, we talked a little bit about PDF and uh, what sustainability meant and what that means in the context of computing. And uh, I want to talk to you about that here. Um, uh, hopefully we're going to work. Okay. So, uh, in terms of bona fides, I uh, have been working with PDFs in one form or another for about 15 years through a series of uh, products and services that, uh, in the first couple of instances, uh, extract content from uh, PDF documents and the latest iteration, uh, recovering structured data from them. Um, and that all happened very accidentally. Uh, and while I was doing that sort of commercial work uh, and completely in, in, in parallel, I developed a passion for learning about uh, you know, past and current efforts to build what I'm going to call revolutionary computing systems, uh, by, by which I mean things that were uh, intended to completely change how computing is done and to do so in a way that would be long lasting effectively forever. Um, you know, as, as Examples here, I would, I would point to, uh, I hope everyone can see this, uh, you know, Unix and TCP and Ethernet and BitTorrent, things that sort of run our world today. Same thing with uh, uh, x86 ARM and uh, sort of brewing now is the uh, RISC-V instruction set, um, uh, architecture I mean, and then all sorts of I have a particular uh, predilection for uh, programming language theory and programming models, and so I, I've done all sorts of deep dives into things like Lisp and the history of Excel and Visual Basic and HyperCard and things like that. And all of these, absolutely. <laughs> Fight the power. Uh, <laughs> and uh, in my title slide, I talked about mention 100-year systems, and, and I sort of apply that, that uh, uh, classification to things like these, so not in so far as uh, a particular implementation is going to last for 100 years, but uh, more in the Paul Graham-esque uh, sense of a 100-year programming language, if, we're, if you're familiar with that uh, blog post from many years ago, where he talked about not necessarily a particular implementation of a programming language that we'd be using a hundred years hence, but uh, be on a lively, non-dead-end evolutionary track. And so a lot of these, you can draw very, uh, uh, very strong threads through them from their uh, uh, predecessors into the, uh, you know, mo modern times and certainly a lot of these things we will be using uh, likely for decades if, if, if not a hundred years. Um, and sort of in a case study of how familiarity can breed contempt, you know, like I said, I was working with PDF documents a lot. Uh, I'm not going to talk about what that experience has been like, but it's, you know, you're down in the, in the uh, uh, trenches of things and not particularly appreciating the forest for the trees. And while I was going on in this parallel track of, of you know, investigating and learning about all these different uh, uh, systems that I would term revolutionary, uh, uh, I never really included PDF in that category until uh, relatively recently. Um, but it, it really should be included in this uh, pantheon because in, in both in terms of its uh, uh, scale and vision from inception, uh, its, its impact on computing both when it was first conceived currently and as far as we can tell going into the future uh, has been uh, monumental. Um, very, very few other technologies have, have demonstrated longevity on the sort of scale that PDF has. Uh, and, and there's little in the way of competition in, this, in, the, in, in, in the space that it occupies. And it, it really embodies the essence of uh, what you might call computational infrastructure. And it was and still is revolutionary in that respect. Um, and so while I was putting together this, this presentation, uh, I, I came across a, uh, the obligatory XKCD uh, comic. It just came out like a month or two ago or whatever. And I'm just going to run through it very quickly just because of the weirdness on the screen. And so the, the title is My Access to Resources on Any Given Subject. And we have books here that span, you know, 
all of time, essentially. And then, you know, uh, some, some PDF that has content on a particular subject you might have interest in. And it was published, and we're probably going to expect it to continue. Whereas, likewise, for, you know, microfiche and other uh, strictly archival uh, uh, methods that we might rely upon from time to time. But a lot of the technology, especially the stuff that we find ourselves immersed in on a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's particular databases that are hosted somewhere where the front ends and back ends collapse because of lack of maintenance or uh, you know, deprecation of particular technology that are, uh, that are being used. You know, mobile apps obviously have a churn rate approaching zero days. Um, any, 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 any particular software that works with a data set that you might work with, the vendor goes out of business, uh, hopefully the software is open source. If not, even if it was, can you maintain it? Probably not. And then, you know, the, the promise of multimedia and reference ma uh, materials being on CD-ROM that was, at one time, looked to be revolutionary uh, in, in terms of having a, uh, a long-term impact upon how we work with computing as sort of fallen by the wayside as well. And so, you know, you know, microfiche and microfilm, obviously, that's sort of forever within the bounds of the physical materials, likewise with books. But PDF really does stick out here in this range of things that we use to consume information and exchange data uh, uh, far beyond the other alternatives that we work with frequently in computing. Um, and so I'm just going to throw out this notion that if we can learn from PDF's heritage and the choices that were uh, made in, in, in the course of conceiving it, we can build more revolutionary systems like it that have at least the prospect of lasting for decades, if not 100 years. Um, yeah. So in order to do that, we have to take a little trip back in time. Uh, and, and, and so in order to do that, it's sort of like, uh, you know, <laughs> dissolve to dissolve to the Wayback Machine or whatever. Uh, you have to be of a certain generation, I guess, to get that. <laughs> so a very, very brief uh, timeline, essentially, of how PDF came to be. Um, uh, so Chuck Gaethje and uh, John Warnock, the principals of what would eventually become Adobe Systems, were working at this company called Evans & Sutherland uh, back in the 70s. And Evans & Sutherland, uh, their business was in producing uh, uh, real-time simulation displays. And so you can think of that being the, the projectors that uh, beam uh, you know, pictures of uh, constellations and galaxies up into planetariums and the uh, uh, sort of vector graphics displays that you found in that time period in uh, airplane cockpits, especially for the military. Uh, and so in order to render those sorts of displays, Evans and Sutherland were in the business of uh, writing systems that would take a abstract description of some data and render it to something, whether it was a planetarium or a, uh, a, a fighter plane cockpit. Uh, and so Gishi and Warnock were sort of immersed in that and did a lot of work in that area. Eventually, they went over to uh, Xerox PARC, uh, which is where they developed a uh, uh, page description language called Interpress. And at the time, they were hoping that since Xerox uh, was a behemoth of a uh, vendor for uh, printing mechanisms of all sorts, whether it was uh, you know, offset printers or plotters or whatever, that eventually Interpress would become their de facto uh, page description language for outputting to those devices. That ended up not coming to pass all the, for all sorts of reasons related to the lack of uh, commercialization uh, that Xerox pursued out of their Park labs. Uh, so they were deeply frustrated and ended up uh, leaving Xerox Park to form Adobe, where they created PostScript. Um, this, is, this is roughly 1982-83, uh, and eventually released uh, uh, the first PostScript reference manual, I believe, in 1984, uh, when they collaborated with, with Apple to produce the Laser Writer, which uh, really had, a, obviously, a, a huge impact on desktop publishing, or created that industry, actually. Um, and then some years passed, and they learned a lot from their experience with PostScript and trying to solve uh, a lot of the problems uh, that PostScript ended up not being quite uh, sufficient to satisfy. And 
originally proposed internally, uh, PDF as a refinement and essentially replacement for, for PostScript in 91, and then, uh, uh, you know, sort of stabilized it into roughly the form that we rely upon today in 1994 with the uh, version 1.1 of the spec. Um, and to just give a very brief overview of what, uh, what we're talking about in terms of rendering things to a screen or to a printer or a plotter or other output device, there's really only three things that go into rendering a page of data. You've got stylized text using uh, now very sophisticated fonts, but back in uh, 1991 and, and especially in 1984, uh, you know, font technology was nowhere near where it is today, but still they were reaching for the ability to, to, to have stylized typefaces. Uh, you have raster graphics, uh, which are a, uh, a fixed dimension set of pixels that are rendered in a, in a particular range. And then uh, that's a very fuzzy uh, picture of someone who has uh, written a version of asteroids to run on an oscilloscope. So that's using uh, vector graphics uh, to render those. And vector graphics are contrasted with uh, rasters in that the, uh, each, each thing being painted is a path as opposed to a pixel. And so a, a, a vector path is a, uh, between one point and another point, you might draw a line, you might draw a Bezier curve, you might draw a cubic curve, you might draw a circle that you fill with a particular color, et cetera. And so by composing all those different operators, you can uh, land on roughly any visualization you like. The most uh, well-known modern implementation of vector graphics that a lot of you, especially in the web world, might come across is SVG, which is a declarative uh, way of representing vector graphics, whereas in a lot of page description languages, it's more of a procedural uh, do this, do, then do that, then do the other thing. So I've said, uh, oh, sorry. And so uh, Gishi and Warnock were interested in this display problem. If you have this, this matrix of a whole bunch of different types of displays, you've got oscilloscopes or other dedicated vector displays, uh, you've got, um, you've got uh, raster displays like LCDs or CRT monitors uh, back in the day, you've got printers of all sorts, you've got fax machines, plotters, laser printers, um, and, and I'm just throwing teletypes down in there, and we'll come to that in a second, as just another output mechanism that you might think of as trying to maintain a, a faithful representation of some kind of uh, data to a particular output medium. This is what is sometimes referred to as the, as the display problem, trying to solve uh, the uh, issue of having a single representation that regardless of where you happen to sit in this matrix, uh, you'll, you'll get something that roughly approximates the intention of the original author and creator. And so the general category of things that solve this problem are called page description languages, which I mentioned a couple different times. Uh, it's I'm just going to read this. Any it, a page description language is any characterization of a layout and contents of a page and collectively a document uh, that is more efficient or expressive than the visually equivalent bitmap of that page for a particular uh, output device. And so I could have a bitmap of my monitor right here at a particular resolution, but if I walk that bitmap over to a high resolution plotter, it will not be sufficient for my expectations. I'm going to expect a far higher resolution uh, result there than on my monitor. Uh, and so there's a ton of page description languages that try to skin this problem. Uh, DBI and Interpress and PostScript and PDF and dozens and dozens in that uh, uh, space over decades really uh, uh, tried to nail this and, and, and PDF is really the one that's landed on top. And I mentioned teletype as a, or, uh, you know, terminal displays, another way of putting it, as a potential output uh, uh, method. And some people will sort of uh, balk at this characterization, but, uh, you know, for, uh, this, is, this is a, uh, a tabular rendering of some data pulled from uh, a, I think, accounting uh, workbook from the 19th century. People have been using simple white space and spacing of text on a page in order to uh, uh, convey structure and uh, relative information for, for centuries, essentially. Um, and 
I've said before, and I'll say here again, that ASCII was really the first page description language. Even though it doesn't have any particular instructions for uh, uh, formatting, as, as, as we might know it today, it does have uh, a set of control uh, codes that, when tied with a particular teletype or, or output device, will move the print head forward, move it back, move to the next page, set tab stops in order to yield uh, a, a visually pleasing uh, useful representation of a set of data. Uh, and so that's sort of the simplest, uh, most common page description language that, that I would say exists. Um, and so a couple words about PostScript. PostScript was the direct uh, antecedent to uh, a PDF, and it's what Yishi and Warnock worked on uh, sort of in their transition out of Xerox into Adobe. Um, and it's a stack-based interpreted language. It is not a uh, declarative uh, uh, display mechanism at all. It's a programming language, fully fledged. You can write arbitrary programs in PostScript, and people do, sort of in uh, hobby capacity. Um, and you can embed bitmaps and reference fonts externally, but compared to what we're used to now, it's a fairly uh, uh, brittle and, and less user-friendly process. And one of the key aspects of PostScript is that because it's a uh, interpreted language and it's turn complete to boot, uh, part of the specification of, po of PostScript was to push the interpretation of these source code files out to the edge, so out to the printers themselves. Um, and in fact, the first, the first PostScript device that was commercially produced, the laser writer that was uh, made in conjunction with uh, Apple and HP, I believe, uh, it contained a far more powerful processor in order to render PostScript programs than did the original Macintosh that was usually connected to it driving that printer. Um, yeah. So just to give you a little bit of an example, hopefully you can see this. Uh, this is a simplest PostScript uh, program. This is actually, I pulled this from, from Wikipedia. I don't program in PostScript so I didn't have any samples just lying about. Uh, you can name a font. Uh, if you have a custom font that you need to embed along with the PostScript file, that gets very challenging. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, uh, problems with the, uh, with the approach, you can set the font size and move to a particular place on, this, on the output device uh, and then write some text out and then you're done. So each PostScript file would be a very long program of a series of sequential uh, 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 statements like this. You could rebind operators however you like uh, so as to build up abstractions and it was uh, sort of a, a remarkable env environment certainly compared to the per device page description languages that uh, preceded it. So Adobe did well with PostScript. Uh, it came out in 84, uh, as I said, uh, but pretty quickly it became clear that there were some shortcomings. Um, because it was a program and it needed to be sent to an output device that could uh, run that program uh, in, in an efficient way, uh, that simply wasn't, that was, a, that was a huge barrier in terms of driving down the cost of printers. As I said, you needed a more powerful uh, uh, processor in the printer than you did in the personal computer that was ostensibly driving it. And so one of the main uh, concerns that they had in terms of the distribution and usage of PostScript was uh, having something that would eliminate that, uh, uh, that particular requirement so as to drive down the cost of printers and therefore presumably make it, make it more likely for uh, 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 documents using their technologies to be distributed and used widely. Uh, otherwise, it's also because each file is a program, fully fledged, uh, there's not really a lot you can do in terms of piecemeal extension and modification. It's just like writing a program now. And even today, there are a few people here and there that write PostScript by hand, uh, as you would write a regular program in any other programming language, in order to yield very particular effects. Um, and this was not a very productive environment, given that they wanted to have 
for example, automated tooling that would stamp a particular uh, logo or header on the top of every page within a document that would require some sort of like uh, automated machine manipulation of the code that if you're familiar with that sort of uh, work within modern programming languages is extremely challenging today depending on the sort of raw materials you're working with. It was even more uh, uh, far-fetched back then. So in 1991, John Warnock wrote, uh, and probably in conjunction with a lot of other people, wrote uh, this white paper, basically an internal memo within Adobe describing what they were calling the Camelot Project. And this is a, uh, this was the code name for, for PDF. And it's, for, for, for someone like me uh, that is interested in how, uh, again, what I'll call revolutionary computing systems uh, and how they come about, this is a remarkable document. In a very short amount of uh, time and space, uh, uh, Warnock and his team set out exactly what the problems are with both PostScript and the page description languages that came before it, uh, the weaknesses that they've discovered within the market, the, the primary challenges that they see within their user base in terms of being able to exchange documents uh, that yield a reliable, uh, faithful representation and, uh, by the recipient. Uh, and I'm just going to read the last... Uh, uh, the uh, last um, sentence here. What industries badly need is a universal way to communicate documents across a wide variety of machine configurations, operating systems, and communication networks. These documents should be viewable on any display and should be printable on any modern printers. If this problem can be solved, then the fundamental way people work will change. Um, I don't know about you, but that just that makes my socks roll up and down. Uh, that's the sort of that's the sort of you know language and disposition that I I, I try to have when I look at computing and how it can be different and better. Uh, and and to see someone uh, sort of with with malice aforethought saying, here's what we need to do, and we're going to go do it. And obviously standing here, you know, 25 years after the fact, knowing that that's how things really played out is incredibly inspiring to me. Um, and so PDF was really a, a refinement of PostScript uh, in a lot of ways, but in other ways it was a, a radical departure. Uh, so instead of a program uh, uh, that you could potentially link in fonts and link in bitmap images, and I don't, depending on how old you are, you may have had the experience of sending a PostScript file over a printer, and the file and the font file is not being in the right place, and then you know nothing looks right when it gets printed out. Uh, PDF solves this problem top to bottom. You can embed font files, images, any other resources that you need in order to render a document on a printer or a display or other device, uh, and it all is a self-contained blob that contains all that stuff. So you can email it, put it in a CMS, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, print the source out on, a, on, on paper and OCR the thing back in and it'll all work out in the end. Uh, and it uses a restricted subset of PostScript for describing uh, uh, display operations. And this was essential for their uh, efficiency concerns at the time. They didn't want to force people to buy, you know, thousand, multi-thousand dollar printers at an entry level in order to print decent looking documents. They wanted to be able to enable their, their you know, uh, 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 printer manufacturer partners to produce relatively cheap printers that would still uh, yield very high quality output. And so the subset that of, of PostScript that PDF uses is not Turing complete. It doesn't have uh, looping and other control constructs that uh, were, were available within PostScript. It doesn't allow you to uh, dynamically redefine uh, core operators in the language as, as, as you could in PostScript. And so it's much more amenable to processing on lower power devices, especially personal computers of, of all uh, description back in the day, and still now, uh, the fact that you can render a PDF on the lowest uh, rank uh, smartphone today is really an uh, enduring legacy of the, of the uh, forethought that they put into architecturally optimizing uh, a PDF for display on low-end devices. Sort of more importantly, I think, uh, in terms of 
lessons we can learn from it. Instead of, again, instead of a single source file of PostScript being a program that needs to be evaluated, each PDF is a well-structured object model. It's not a program. Uh, and so there is an interpretation of that object model that needs to occur, uh, but each chunk of rendering instructions can be segmented out according to whatever criteria that the, that the producing application uh, uh, has, and it sits within this file in a way that can be manipulated after the fact. It's an object graph. Um, further important in terms of its uh, uh, disbursement and ubiquity later is that it was introduced and revised via an actual specification uh, and then exhaustively standardized later on and this uh, this spoke to a lot of the concerns of institutional users of uh, or future at that point institutional users of uh, PDF documents like large corporations and governments so that they knew that regardless of the fate of Adobe, that if they decided to move a document that was particularly important into PDF, no matter what, they would still be able to work with that after the fact. Again, getting back to the same sort of reliability that you might find within printed matter or microfiche, back to that XKCD uh, 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 cartoon, same thing with PDF. Adobe could vanish from existence right now and there would still be a thriving tools ecosystem that anybody could rely upon to, to continue to use PDF. And so this morning, James was just hopping up and down saying, we want to see tech stuff, we want to see tech stuff. And so I'm going to walk you through a very brief, uh, very brief crash course in what the internals of a PDF look like. Uh, we already saw what PostScript looks like. Uh, you can just presume that every PostScript file is more of the same. It's just a very long program. Not so with uh, uh, PDF documents. So at the end of every PDF document, what, there's what's called a uh, XREF table. And what this is, is byte offsets. Each one is a byte offset into that PDF document. And that at the beginning, at that byte offset is the beginning of one object within the document. And so uh, the first... Um, offset is usually ignored, and so this is object one, that's object two, that's object three, and so on. And so you open, so you can uh, read in the contents of a PDF document, look at the uh, end of it, find the XREF header, and there's your directory. It's a little more complicated than, than that, but that's roughly it. So once you go into a PDF document, you need to find the catalog. This one happens to be in object five. There's a key value dictionary here that contains all sorts of interesting information. For example, there's metadata like uh, uh, modification date and title and things like that that some people use, some people don't. That'll be in another dictionary elsewhere that you can or you can resolve that or not depending on your application. There's going to be reference to a pages object which is at object one and so you look at the, your table over here and go find object one and load it up, and yes, it's a pages object. Uh, there's only one page, <clears throat> and here's its child. It's object six, so you go back to your table. You look up where object six is in the document, and you find right there, there's an object that's a page. Here's a crop box that defines a rectangle of a particular width and height. That's very important for uh, you know, offset printing and things like that. Um, uh, here's a contents array. Within these objects, you'll find that subset of the PostScript language that I was describing that actually has the rendering instructions, and we'll see that in a second. Uh, the, the content might be, the, the page might be rotated by a particular uh, number of degrees. Uh, media box, that's something related to crop box that we don't need to get into. And resources, that's pretty key. That's a reference to an object whose uh, key value dictionary will contain things like fonts and uh, 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 color sets and indications whether or not images are used and on and on and on. These are all open, these, these key value dictionaries. Anybody can put anything into here when you're generating a, a, a PDF document. And so if you have a particular workflow that you need to support within your organization, and there's not something prefab available within the PDF specification or your existing tool set to do it, you can change how you generate your PDFs to throw whatever metadata you want into any of these objects appropriate to your usage of it, and you can 
pass it along to customers, put it in your CMS, pass it along to vendors, and if it eventually winds its way back to you, you can pick that up. Or maybe you have a printer vendor that's looking for particular tags to an, instruct how the uh, uh, pre-press and, and uh, uh, printing process should work, and they'll look for their, their dedicated tags in some uh, uh, a key value dictionary somewhere. So it's extremely open, very extensible by anybody who's generating or consuming a, a, a PDF document. Uh, and just to conclude our tour, we have the contents of the page. We're going to go to object 12, look that up in our, look that up in our uh, XREF table. And we see here a stream of uh, that, that subset postscript uh, 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 rendering instructions. And what this is doing, this is manipulating the stack in a way that you need, don't need to worry about. This is drawing a rectangle with an origin width and height. Uh, this is setting a color space, probably saying that we're going to be you know, working with RGB maybe. Uh, and then we're setting uh, all, all rendering within a PDF document is, uh, operates within an affine space that can be transformed however you want using, uh, uh, using all that linear algebra you hope you studied in college. Um, so that sets, our, sets up our initial transformation matrix. We set our font using a name that comes out of that uh, resources dictionary that I mentioned at the top. And then you start showing letters. That's a character P, D, FT, EXT, this spells out the name of one of my first products. It came from a test document that I put together years ago. So that spells PDF text stream in that uh, uh, restricted, restricted uh, description language. So that's a little bit of a tour of what PDF is like internally and some of the differences that it has vis-a-vis uh, -vis PostScript. And other people could come to other conclusions. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw out mine here. Uh, completely aside from the technology, coming into PDF, you had a small, uh, really experienced team that was uh, you know, dedicated to that particular problem space. You didn't have someone that you just hired on to do a little contract work for you, and they produced this. They, they spent their entire careers leading up to this point. Um, Within the, within the Adobe organization, obviously, because the, you know, the two founders and presumably a lot of their you know, original core team were involved, they had absolute authority and unlimited latitude to tackle this problem. Um, and it, it's sort of very remarkable uh, that they created a new standard, PDF, that directly competed with their bread and butter, what was really paying the bills, PostScript at the time. Uh, the license fees that they were garnering from uh, PostScript printer sales at the time was, I believe, their number one source of income. And you know, starting in 91, they say, well, we're going to completely uh, uh, um, you know, work, work against that in service of solving this problem in a more comprehensive, comprehensive way. Um, at that point in time, they had gone through the process of delivering PostScript, had learned about what it did well and what it didn't do well. A lot of people had a lot of problems with PostScript, and to a certain degree, PostScript was a failure insofar as they had hoped to solve that raft of problems from the start. Uh, and so they had those, those lessons learned on their, uh, on their part. But because they had already gone through that process of delivering PostScript and supporting it for so many years, they had the credibility within the space to be able to do this. So if you had another party at the same time try to promulgate PDF, I'm not sure whether they would have had the same success that Adobe did given they would be a new entrant as opposed to here's this new thing from the organization that we mostly trust with our documents anyway. Um, the first PDF spec was, I believe, 140 pages long. Uh, or not the first, well, version 1.1 was the first that sort of had a fully fledged uh, feature set. I think it was about 140 or 150 pages, which if you come across you know, technical specifications of non-trivial things, that's effectively nothing. Um, and it meant that a, a third party ecosystem could very easily pick this up and run with it and produce the, the panoply of tools and applications that work with PDF that we're, that we're used to today. 
And I already talked about the open data model. Uh, there are entire businesses that have been built upon the fact that you can put any data that you want within PDF documents and use that to drive uh, workflows and uh, you know, manage CMSs and uh, handle, um, uh, do contract management and all those DocuSign features that you're, you know, enjoy are driven by metadata and uh, uh, cryptography happening in the background that's flowing in this uh, 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 channel of an open, uh, open data model and object graph that is within every PDF. Another thing I'll say that's an interesting lesson is that they had a theory of computation applied to their particular domain right from the start. Uh, obviously, they were, uh, Gishi and Warnock and, and, and the rest of the team were, uh, you know, well-trained and deeply versed in, in everything computer science, and they had this notion of what they, needed to what they needed to deliver and what the characteristics were that they needed to bake into the PDF specification from, from the ground up uh, in order to ensure that in the intervening, you know, couple decades now, they've been able to extend it without breaking it or uh, yielding, you know, incompatibilities along the way. And of course, they had partners with expertise in a lot of different complementary fields. So printer manufacturers, general purpose uh, uh, computer makers and operating system vendors like Apple and eventually Microsoft. Um, and also authoring and, and, and production tools from, from people like uh, Quark before Adobe really got into producing those sorts of tools on their own. Uh, and there's a whole separate talk that could dissect the, the, the market and economic forces that, that help PDF grow into, you know, how ubiquitous it is today, but I'm, that's as far as I'm going to say there. Uh, one thing I'll say in terms of a technology management um, uh, and, and product strategy standpoint is that they had tremendous self-restraint, both in terms of introducing PDF originally and maintaining its incredibly tight scope. Uh, uh, and then over the years, not sort of availing themselves uh, overly much of the degree of, of extensibility that it offered. Uh, they could have gone hog wild and given that the, that the uh, data model and object graph that's present in every PDF is uh, arguably far richer and far more capable than, for example, the modern web platform, they could have really gone nuts in terms of, you know, hanging bells and whistles off of this thing and making it a, a complicated and, and fraught thing to use. Uh, that's not to say that they didn't have a couple missteps. Forms in general are sort of problematic in PDFs, uh, and there's, in particular, they made an acquisition of uh, a technology called XFA, uh, which is essentially, uh, it's a rich form technology, but it completely, um, uh, replicates a lot of the PDF specification. So if you have an XFA, and P an XFA form within a PDF document, it's sort of uh, um, two cars sharing the same garage to a certain extent. Um, and they also allowed, at some point, uh, people to embed JavaScript within PDF documents and as a way of introducing interactivity, which sounds nice on the face of it, except that it's also, that's also been the, the number one driver of security uh, uh, breaches with regard to PDF, to the extent that in the earliest versions uh, of Acrobat that included that JavaScript integration, they were actually on the verge of essentially being, uh, 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 you know, blackballed from large organizations because of the security risk that was involved. Eventually, they were able to, to nail down those JavaScript environments and sandbox them appropriately, but it was a fraught move and sort of in contrast to the, in general, uh, great, great care that they took in terms of extending PDF over the years. Uh, and like I said before, you could go back and look at the PDF 1.1 spec and it is completely recognizable compared to the current one. The most recent spec is larger, it supports a lot more stuff, but it is still fundamentally that same gem of an idea. Uh, and the fact that it's persisted for so long and had such an impact on uh, the industry at large and all of our lives, never mind mine, I am happy to call it revolutionary. Uh, so I'm going to say 
I hope you've enjoyed this little tour through PDF and how it might be one of those things that has uh, really had a massive impact on how we uh, do uh, uh, computing in our lives. And I would say go find other heritages of things that you uh, uh, find interesting or find um, uh, invaluable in your life with computing and go revolutionize some more things. Thank you.